so welcome everyone. All We're right. going to get started here. Uh, I'm really, really excited about today. I mean, I'm sure that I've said that in the past at uh, other times, but uh, I'll add another really, really onto it because uh, <laughs> I have been reading Beth's next uh, book, Awakening Humanity, and this is a leap uh, into another dimension. Uh, based on background, we saw it as A Course in Miracles, but now we're going into, as I said, another dimension, I don't know what, the, what word to use besides that. Right. Uh, you'll understand what I'm talking about uh, when we get started. <laughs> Beth had a nice, nice long uh, chat yes. yesterday, as we were saying, just let you introduce Beth a little bit more before we get started. Uh, she lives on a hobby farm mm -hmm. uh, in Minnesota, and uh, we, we share the fact that we both grew up on farms and, and loved it and still do. I long to get back there from time to time, mm -hmm. don't get to very often. And I uh, picked up this book somewhere along the way called A Course in Miracles, and she started reading it and it's transformed her life. And not only that, but being opened uh, to dreams and visionary experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, Helen, there was a lot about Helen Shukman's life that consists around dreams mm -hmm. and, and her visionary experiences too. So it's an interesting kind of thing that seems to be happening as a kind of a, a preload to mm -hmm. folks getting more concrete kind of information coming in. And the concrete information that uh, Beth the God is uh, really incredible because I'm reading her second book, Awakening to Humanity, three quarters of the way through it. I hope to get it all the way done for today. Didn't make it. But, um, well, I'm going to let her tell you what it's about because it's really pretty phenomenal. Um, so, welcome, Beth. You want to tell us a little bit about answering those questions that I just, what's a hobby farm? And how did you come to this course in miracles? And uh, what do you see coming up for us? So we'll we'll wrap it up at four o'clock because of how I talk. So <laughs> we don't well, to, I, no, feel this free is, to interrupt this is me. True. I know this is true. <laughs> it, it, I hope everyone will understand. If it seems as though I'm interrupting her, you're not. It, it, it's it's on purpose. Mm -hmm. You have to pump my brakes or I'll I, just I, I do. I'm not yeah. going to have any trouble getting her to talk. No. So I, uh, yes. the steering wheel is yours. Go. Yes. My, uh, my natural innate talent is storytelling. And so when I get going about things that, yeah, I just can keep, I love telling stories and sharing. Um, so a hobby farm to start off with, uh, we bought, um, well, when I was 12 or younger, I told my grandma who owned, uh, it was like 102 acres. And I said, grandma, someday I'm going to buy part of your farm and I'm going to build a log home right there on that little hill in that bean field. And she said, okay. <clears throat> and then about two months after I got married, which was in 2019, so I've been married 22 years, uh, she said, so when are you, Paul, going to build your log home out there and, and buy the farm? She was 90 years old. And I said, what? That's real? She goes, yep, I never forgot that. And so we did. We bought 40 acres. And in Minnesota, a hobby farm is 40 acres or less. If we bought 40.1 acres, we'd be an actual farm. And that's a whole different tax bracket. So we decided to keep it exactly at the, the maximum we could have without being in a higher tax bracket because um, all I wanted was space for my quarter horses. I have three quarter horses and we have a dog and a few cats. And um, I was telling John, we have some rental honeybees that come out every spring. So we have honeybees. And that's all I really want. I don't want to do any actual hard work because I grew up doing I only wanted the good things about farming, which was enjoying the animals and the nature and the, the woods. And um, I didn't want to actually have to go pull weeds or harvest anything major with equipment that breaks all the time. I swear, I don't think you, we've ever made it through a season without a tractor or a combine or wheels falling off or just, yeah. I just don't know how that massive equipment can work all the time anyway. It's, it's, it does hard things, you know. Uh, right. tractors and combines work hard so that was the hobby farm that's how we ended up there we have two kids two teenagers a 16 and a 17 year old who will be 18 in about a month so 16 and 18 year old girl and boy and um, I've often asked them if they've wanted to move to town because we'll go to town and we'll ride our bikes around so they can you know hang out and do things but uh, they they'd rather drive to town and stay out in the country than live in town 
where they could be near, you know, the gas station for snacks and running around with their friends, but they somehow make both work. So um, that's the hobby farm. And I've been here, like I said, since uh, the house got finished in January of 2000. And um, so during that time, we started our family and my oldest uh, child, my daughter was born in 2004. So up until then, I had been a spiritual seeker my entire life, like from a very, very young age. And I know I've told the story before, and I don't know if I have any new listeners, but when I was five, it was before First Communion, I was raised Catholic, but my parents were very relaxed about it. Uh, my dad was raised Lutheran. He joined Catholic because that's what you do when you're Catholic. You make everybody conform when you get married, if you can. Right. And um, But they were very open-minded people. So that made a big difference and uh, but I was saying my nightly prayers and I was wondering if God could hear me and I'll try and make this story quick because I've told it before but I thought maybe he can't and maybe God can't even see me so I thought I'm going to try something different still laying in my bed and just saying him in my mind mm -hmm. I'll kneel in front of my window and say I'm out the window and try and look up and be visible and heard and there was a cactus in a pot on my windowsill and oh my god and so I just sat there and it was between my elbows when I was saying my prayers because it wasn't very big and it was in the middle of the windowsill and I knelt and that thing sat there. And then I pulled on my shade and the curtains and went to bed. And the next morning, there were three huge pink blooms on that cactus. And I was blown away. This little kid, you know, you wake up and you're like, oh, my God, God heard me. <laughs> I run downstairs. I remember my brothers were at the table and I have one older brother who's three years older than me and two little ones who are we're all about two or three years spaced apart. And the older brother, of course, being the older brother is like, well, you know, cacti bloom like that quickly when they've been watered. You probably watered it. And I, I didn't know if I had or not. I don't remember. But I thought, okay, that does happen naturally. However, and this has been always my reasoning with so many miracles in my life, it's the timing, the timing. Ordinary things can become extraordinary if they're put in the right spot at the right time in your life. Most things are that. Most miracles are just awesome coincidences. So that started me on a life of dedication. I said the rosary every day from sixth grade through my freshman year of college, all because I heard about the children of Medjugorje, and they were seeing the Virgin Mary. That was the first time I learned um, that people were talking to God, or a someone I considered as high as or up with God. Mary was second on my list for amazing, and Jesus and God were about equal, and the holy buckets. There's people alive today that's not just Old Testament stuff, you know, and um, so that it, it didn't take much to spur me on. So by the time we got married and had these the first child I was like okay well now you have this little baby crawling around Miranda was you know under a year because she was crawling and I remember watching her and this was one of those poignant moments in life I'm sitting on the couch watching her go across the floor and I thought everything is perfect like I have my farm I got my horses my good husband I have a job I love and our first child is born and we're not going to be childless you know those are big things that you have on your list if that's what you have on your list those are on my list and I thought oh, so why is there still dissatisfaction what more could you want if you had to live anywhere in the world it's like well I'd live right here if you could have all the money you wanted would that do it no because that's just more stuff like you can't there's no way to have more and feel different. And I thought it's the spiritual thing. I'm missing something here. And I remember when I was younger, I asked God, I was feeling frustrated just as a teenager. And I thought, if you would just tell me what to do, I would do it. How come this is so hard? How come I don't know what you want? Like I'm trying to be a good person and things still don't work out sometimes. And I, I feel like I'm butting my head up against a wall and I don't know how to stop. And, um, so I thought, God, I need that instruction manual. I need to know what you want because I know the stuff outside me isn't the answer because I should be beyond belief happy. And I was, but that, you know, you all have that feeling of there's still something that I, I want and I, it's not outside me. And that's when I started finding the course in, um, 
in the Barnes and Noble in my nearest town in Mankato. I'd go there. The first time I saw it was this dark blue book with no nonsense on the front. A Course in Miracles text manual for teachers workbook. It looked very intimidating. It was very thick and it was wrapped in, in cellophane. I couldn't open it, but I could see it was Bible-like with thin pages and a lot of dense words just by the look of it. And I just put it back on the shelf because I thought, wow, some poor person has to read that for a class in college, <laughs> some ethics class or religion class. I thought, oh, I can't even imagine that's a big book. And but it had my attention because it was so odd compared to everything else with their pictures and their flashy covers. And so I was in the new age section looking for stuff on tarot and numerology and astrology and angels and ghosts and, and UFOs and things, because that all interested me very greatly. And um, I'd been down all those roads. I am a 22 year tarot card reader, and I still get them out once in a while. And, and just because it is everything is a way God can communicate with you if you if you use it positively and lovingly is, is what I found. But anyway, side tangent there. <clears throat> I went back and forth with this book. I'd go in the bookstore, not looking for it, and there it would be a copy of it. And I'd pick it up, look at it again, because it was so intriguing and scary. And then I'd put it back. And then I'd go in there. I'm like, I'm going to get it this time. I'm just going to get it. It's $40, though. Do you really? I mean, it doesn't even look like a good story. There's nothing on the back <laughs> to tell you like, what kind of story it is. And, and I thought, well, a lot of spiritual books aren't really a story. A lot of them are just inner work. OK, OK, go get it. Then I'd go in there and it wouldn't be on the shelf. And it's like, okay, well, guess not this time. And went back and forth for months like that. Um, till one day I, I pulled it off the shelf and I'm looking at it. I'm like, either you're going to buy this or you're not. And that inner voice, which by now I was accustomed to because I had learned to meditate around 15 or 16. I started meditating regularly and journaling, um, speaking with angels. And that is a good story. If you want me to segue, I had one miraculous time. I had my younger brother, Matt, who was three years, we were the middle children. We were meditating together and Matt wanted to know if we were really talking to our angels. He would just join me once in a while. And he said, let's experiment. Let's both ask the same question and see if we get the same answer. So um, um, we asked, is this real? Is this really happening? Are we really meditating and communicating with angels? And then we sat quietly. And then we said, okay, we're done. It wasn't just a few minutes. So we both turned and wrote down what we got. And I told my brother, Matt, I said, I didn't hear any words. I didn't get any message, but I felt warmth on my throat and on my right knee. And Matt's eyes got all big. <laughs> He's like eight or nine. He goes, he got all teary. He goes, I didn't hear anything, but I saw in my mind's eye, your angel kneeling in front of you with one hand on your throat to help you speak to God and one hand on your knee, on your right knee. She was kneeling in front of you. And we both were like, <laughs> holy buckets. So I was used to the supernatural by this time. So I'm standing in the bookstore having, you know, journals worth of angel messages. And I heard this inner voice say, read this book, do exactly what it says do not miss my message for the second time around. And I went, oh, and was the first time around? I don't even know. I've since discovered that that was when he was here on earth. Uh, 2000 years ago was the first time he came with his message. And um, I was there during that time in a past life, which was downloaded to me one morning at three in the morning. That's another whole story. <laughs> I wasn't anybody famous. That, those were my first questions. Was I one of the apostles? No. Was I just somebody from the Bible? Was I anybody? Any would know, anyone would know in the Bible? No. Okay, well, at least I wasn't Judas Iscariot. You know? <laughs> and, and, and the voice said, no, you were a simple fisherman, but you were uh, an ill-tempered, abusive, little, small man. And I said, okay, well, what did I do with Jesus? And again, it was this whole big story, but it ended up being, I made eye contact, with, eye contact with Jesus when he was speaking at a gathering uh, near where I lived. And that eye contact in that brief second, everything good in me pulled forward. And that was it. We never exchanged words. It was like two seconds of eye contact with Jesus. And I was transformed. Like he put forward everything in me that was good. And I quit being that man. So yeah, that segue out of that, I brought the course home and I sat and looked at it and I thought, okay, 
uh, how do I proceed? And I was told just read it cover to cover. Don't skip any pages. Don't try to look ahead and just read each page one at a time and do exactly what it says. And when I closed the book, it took me years, I think probably close to 10 years because the text was so dense and the words made no sense. And I felt like I was missing the point through half of the text until at one point I read the words that this world is an illusion and nothing around you is your real home. And I went, that's such a relief. I'm so glad this isn't my real home. And I knew it. I knew it. It's all a bunch of BS. Okay, I think I'm starting, it's breaking through. And I thought a, a book this big has to repeat its message because just from my experience of pharmacy school, giant textbooks, you, it has to repeat itself because it, it's just different aspects of the same message. You just cannot write a book about one thing and not have it repeat in certain ways in multiple ways. So by the time I, um, then I was a diehard reader. I read it every day from that point forward. And it took me, you know, just a few months to finish um, the lessons. I did the lessons at one a day for a year. And I thought, okay, I'm not glowing. I'm not floating or, or evaporating or transferring to this new reality. I finished the lessons and nothing extraordinary happened. I'll read the clarification of terms and the, the manual for teachers. And when I got to the last page, and I thought, okay, wow, nothing happened. I'm not even sure I feel more peaceful or loving or better. I, I think I failed the course. I failed the course. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I'm the worst student ever. And that voice came into my head and said, no, nobody understands this the first time around. And you are not the worst student ever. How about we go through everything again but together, let's go back to the lessons. We'll start over and I'll explain them to you as we go. And I thought, how come I never thought to ask for help all along? Like you don't realize how strong your ego is that you don't even ask for help and understanding. <laughs> and it was there all along. That began my book, Awakening to One Love, those daily conversations. And then stuff in between would happen. Life would happen in between where you have traumatic things happen and just questions about death and, um, mostly death. There's three chapters where death comes up because that's such a big one. And I'll never forget that the answer to that really, really came to me when um, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to sit and imagine holding someone you love. And I said, oh, okay, okay. He goes, I'm going to explain death to you. Okay, sit there and hold someone you love. I said, okay, I've got my children on my lap in my imagination. I said, okay, I'm sitting here with my children. He goes, now rest your forehead against theirs in your mind. Kiss their cheek and put your cheek up to theirs in your mind. I said, okay, this is the best conversation yet. I said, this is so nice. And he said, do you feel close to your children when you're holding them that close? I said, I do. That feels so nice. And he said, right there, that is the farthest away you will ever be from them. The body is a true barrier. When you're out of your body, you can be even closer. And I'm like, I can't even imagine that. And the Holy Spirit's like, I know. That's why it's so hard to describe to you that when someone crosses over, they're closer to you than when they were in life. Mm -hmm. But you will, you always look for them after that where they're not. You're looking for their body, but you got to look for them within your heart and you will feel that love. And it drives you to tears and you think you're mourning, but you're really not grieving, you're loving. And I went, oh, okay, okay. So my mom, who is a year ago with terminal cancer, who is actually being maintained right now on, on an experimental drug to keep her cancer from getting uh, resistant to the chemo, she's maintaining. And I told her it's the experimental drug plus our weekly meditation where we contact our Christ center. <laughs> and, and I said, and it's our focus on you not being a sick body but letting the body do whatever it has to do, but knowing that no matter what, you are full of life. And we are going to enjoy that strong life every chance we get. And, and I know when mom passes that I will be very um, devastated in my heart. They live only four miles from us. Um, when grandma bought this farm, she owned my parents' farm before that. And they're only four miles away. And then she moved to this farm so my dad, her son, could have that farm. And it was all 
a cascade of farms that just happen to be in my family. <laughs> and so I've grown up four miles from my parents. I've either lived on the farm or just four miles away my whole life, excluding the years I was at college. So I see my parents every week and have for the last 15 years, we have coffee yeah. once a week. So anyway, the body is truly a barrier, but we look at it as the end all be all connection with people, but we're looking with the wrong eyes. And when someone passes, we see the empty chair next to us, we see the empty place at the table, but they've moved. That's all they've done is shifted into a more loving space that can be closer to you than ever. And yes, you miss the sound of their voice and the touch of their hand, but it's it's just a different experience, a different relationship. And both my grandparents, um, my grandmas are very close to me and both of them have come to me in dreams and helped me with problems that I'd had. And it was so clear, the message was so clear and they were so loving um, that I, I love the relationship I have with them now, even though it's different than when I was with them in, in, in the flesh. Um, so um, let's see. So then that came to Awakening to One Love. And then I believe the third question is, where are we headed now? Which is pretty good. That only took 30 minutes. Oh my God. Yeah, I know. I'm so would, you, sorry. would you believe how quickly this time goes? By? I know. I'm so sorry. I, I, it goes I, Zoom. Yes. By the way, there's a couple of interesting overlaps on it. I had no idea. I had a cactus in my window when I was a kid, mm -hmm. except it fell out. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what you know what happened to that cactus that bloomed so I brought it to college with me and at some point I had an apartment and it was on top of the tv stand next to the tv near a window and I left for class and I came home one day and my dog I don't know what got into her head but she pulled it down and ate the roots off of it, it oh my died. god she ate the roots off of it know what maybe mineral deficient who knows what gets into dogs but she decided right. that day the cactus um needed to her. be eaten yeah it was gonna be okay. her, her thing so anyway that so interesting so yeah you had uh yes. one other little thing was that are you and i used to go see helen shookman for counseling mm -hmm. and helen would do this interesting thing when she wanted to make a point with me and that is that she would reach over and tap my knee Right. And I thought, why? That's a very interesting gesture. To kind of aggressive. You know? <laughs> kind well, of physical, was, you know? it was actually very kind. It was like, <laughs> but it was like, get this point, you know, mm. do this thing, mm -hmm. you know, take me seriously here now in terms of what I'm saying. Right. Mm -hmm. anyway, you what? know, go ahead. When you talk about that, um, uh -huh. I've heard of people who have tried to get me to sign up for this thing called, is it EFT tapping where you, tap and yeah, yeah, yeah. or a tap i i told them i i don't need that but i do know what purpose it serves when you tap your body you're focusing on the present moment like get your attention here yeah, right now exactly. it pulls you out of the past and the future okay. so helen had a very uh subtle little tapping there to get you like you said yes get in the present moment listen listen up don't let your mind wander i have this the pay attention mm -hmm. all right, all right. good job one helen. time she told me to, <laughs> to let a relationship go and on the other time she said uh, that I needed to call somebody, you know, call that person, you mm -hmm. know, things like that. Those are awesome. Anyhow, mm -hmm. let's get on to the next book, the book that is coming out pretty soon because uh, this is phenomenal. And I begin to talk about uh, awakening of humanity. Mm -hmm. How did this get started? And I'm going to put my seatbelt on here. Uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> this was come i i honestly I, when i started awakening to one love and i was like part way through it i was told there will be three books and i thought i don't know what more i could write about but i'll just worry about this one first no. and that was in 2018 and like a few years went by it wasn't until um 2021 that um the second book started and it, I didn't, it wasn't what I at all I expected to write about. I had a little foreshadowing in my first book that um, the Holy Spirit said, we'll go into greater detail about extraterrestrials in your next book. And I thought, I don't even know what I would say about extraterrestrials. Thinking about myself, what's in my own mind. I had a few experiences as a child where I physically was aboard. And feel 
you know, physically, which in the dream can be very real, but this was like, I, I could smell smells. Um, and also physically seeing craft in the sky uh, with a boyfriend coming home from a date one night and saw three craft. One of them was a little hill that my house. Oh. Oh, was right above this spot where we're digging our hole for our house. He's like, well, it's too late now. <laughs> we're going to live in that spot. I go, I forgot all about it because that was when I was uh, 17 years old, you know. So, okay, we're living in, in, in that spot. Totally had forgotten about it till that time. But anyway, so a few years had gone by, written the first book, had no book on the horizon that I thought I could, I was just, you know, living my life. I was not intending to write another book. Elizabeth's internet connection is intermittent. I realize that. Um, I guess there's not much we can do about it. And she wasn't just the gray alien. She was an amphibious being. She had skin like an octopus, like it was kind of blotted, like she could. Beth, uh, Beth, yeah. Can you say that again? We lost your internet connection. Oh, okay. You so, were introducing Martha, right? Yep. Martha entered a dream of mine and she was an amphibious being. She wasn't a great, I, I think it's because I said gray alien. There is a negative vibe with some of those populations. <laughs> it's probably why it cut out. Um, so Martha <laughs> was in this dream and she was trying to cover herself up to hide. She says, I'm being chased. I need to get away. And she said, I'm also very thirsty. And I could tell by her webbed long and she had like, Hmm. we're getting alien interference john uh, yeah right <laughs> it seems like it i but she radiated love and she was good i could feel her goodness and gentleness and i thought she was extraordinarily beautiful which is so odd even in my dream i thought how can you be beautiful you look like a squid woman but you're gorgeous and i said okay i'll help you and i said what i'll get you a whole five gallon pail of water at the well and she said nope i just need like a cup of water just run into the kitchen and get a cup of water but hurry and i went through the whole motions in my dream got a glass of water, brought it down to her. And as she was drinking it, she made eye can contact with me above the glass. And I suddenly woke, I was awake. And I'm like, Oh, my gosh, I'm in my bed. I feel my bed. I feel my pillow and my blankets. I, I, I can feel my husband next to me. And I thought, but the dream isn't dissipating. I'm still in the dream. Like I can, I can feel these things, but I can still see this being. And I thought, Oh, okay, so I'm in a lucid dream. And this is very bizarre to be like bi-located. And I looked at Martha and I said, um, we're not dreaming, are we? This is a different reality or dimension. She said, yes. And I go, you're not being hunted by anybody. You're not in any actual trouble either, are you? And she said, no, I'm not. I said, why did you have me go get you water? <laughs> and she said, when you help someone, you lose all fear of them. When you're called to service, when you need to pull someone from a burning building or a, a trapped under a car, a stranger, you suddenly have a bond with that person and you love them. In those moments, you're acting out of love and love triumphs over every fear. So if you helping is the ultimate way to overcome fear. And she said, if you hadn't helped me and I appeared to you, you would have been scared because of how I look. And I went, okay, okay, because I do feel a bond because I helped you. Even though it was fake, you didn't really need water. That little scenario helped me feel like there's camaraderie there. Um, and I said, um, what is your name? And she said, our language is like your whales when they speak. There's nothing that translates. But she said, go by how you feel when, you, when you're with me. How do I feel to you? Assign me a human name that resonates with you and how I feel to you. And I immediately thought of Martha in the Bible and how she cooked for Jesus and he, she was close to him. And that feeling I got of Martha in the Bible resonated with this being 
of kindness and, and love. And I said, Martha, you feel like a Martha to me, just soft and warm and strong, but also gentle. And she goes, that's perfect. And the rest of that conversation in that lucid dream, she let me look at her whole body. She put her fins up, she put a fin along the rest of her head and down her back. She stood that up for me. I wanted to see that she had some along her, a big one on her forearm that came up like this. She let me see that. And I looked at her hands. They were long, thin. She was taller than me. She was about six feet, six foot one. I'm five eight. And she was like almost a half a head taller than me. Very thin and aerodynamic like a fish. Like her chest was concave it came to kind of a point there was like a little it was shaped this way and her nose was a it, there was no nostrils she had just a little pointed bump and no ears but I could see that she said the membrane is thinner here for me to hear but there's no actual ears and she had three gills on each side of her neck and um, when I was done looking at her she disappeared and I woke up and I went, wow, that was a weird dream. That was so cool. I wrote it all down and contacted Glenn in here because I had to share with him my childhood experiences with being aboard craft, which, um, you know, it's it's 20 to noon right now on my time. So it's 20 to one at yours. I don't want to take up with all of my extraterrestrial experience. Uh. Oh, but do you see uh, John's uh, comment? Up. And I was able to ask her more questions about herself. And um, we had, she, and again, just disappeared. And then the next time she came, I was driving and I went, okay, we're progressing. I'm more and more awake each time. I'm most asleep when I'm asleep and most um, able to receive without barriers. Then the next stage is when you're just waking up or just falling asleep, you're also very receptive because your barriers are down. And also there's two other places I'm very receptive where I'm meditative without meditating. And that's my long hour drive to work or when you're in the shower. So she's able to get through to me when I was driving to work. And and I said, Martha, why do you just disappear when we're done talking? And she said, well, it's a telepathic conversation. I'm not I don't even want to call it channeling because it's like talking to any other human being, but I just can't see her. I can hear her in my mind, but I can't hear her audibly or with my eyes. And she said, when you're in a room with someone, let's say you're at work and you're talking to someone at work, you just start talking. And when you're done talking, you stop talking and you walk away and do other tasks. And she said, that's how it is with us. When I'm done talking, I go off to my other tasks. I don't need to say I'm leaving now or I'm done talking. I'm going to stop talking. You don't say those things. You just start and stop like a natural conversation with anybody in the room. And she said, I'm always in the room. If you need me, you just say, hey, Martha, blah, blah, blah. Ask your question. I will feel you. Can you feel me? Yes. You have your own Martha feel, your own Martha energy. By this point, I could recognize her. And she said, well, it's just like when you're in the room with people. You don't introduce yourself every time you go to speak. It's okay and it's okay to stop and go to take care of tasks in your physical life that you need to take care of that need your full attention. Okay, so it went on and I ended up asking her all kinds of questions, including how did you find me? Why are you even talking to me? If this is real, what are you doing? And where are you? And I found out she's in a different density in a different dimension. She's like a we're supposedly third density here in these physical bodies. And there's up to 12 densities in the realm of physical time and space. And she said she's a ninth density being, her whole people are. They're from a planet called uh, Neba. And it's um, the whole reason she even discovered me is because I started meditating in a different way about two or three months before we made contact. Um, I started thinking how I was one with not just humanity, I was one with nature. And that's opened up a whole other world too of nature spirits. But that's again, another story. <laughs> I share that in my blogs, my contact uh, with, with nature spirits. But um, um, I started opening up to, okay, the planet is alive with spirit because it's growing and moving and all living things. So I'm assuming that's living too. But not just our planet, but there's planets out there I don't even know about 
that I know have life. And I know there's extraterrestrials out there that are also loving God because it has to be that connection everywhere. If God is one with all creation, they have to have civilizations somewhere that have also discovered God and are advanced and more advanced than us. So I'm going to meditate, send my energy down into the earth, and then out through the plants and trees and people, connecting all of us from this planet, and I'm going to shoot it out into the solar system. And I'm going to say, and I did say, whatever vibrates at love and light, join me. I want to be one with you. I am embracing my all-encompassing oneness with God and whatever he created. I don't even know who or what you are, but if you resonate with pure love and unity and goodness, join up. I want to make contact. I'm reaching out and sending out my love beacon because I want to feel the whole shebang. I want to know the whole oneness. Go big or go home. So I did that maybe half a dozen times. And then this Martha thing came up. And she said, I heard your message when you did that. And she said, I was granted permission to contact you and help with the awakening of humanity. And I said, what is the awakening of humanity? She said, well, at some point you develop cosmic consciousness as a group of beings on a planet and join with the rest of the cosmos because there's so much more out there. But you guys have been isolated because you've been cut off by your frequency of war and conflict and the ego. But that's coming loose. It's shaking loose. And I, from her, what she said, her job is one of the main things she does in her world is teaches love and unity. And she goes, I foster growth in others. And she said, since we both have kind of similar vocations where we're trying to love everything, she said, I was granted permission to contact you. And so here I am. And um, she, uh, her messages when she talks about the spiritual aspect of their people and what we need to do here as humans resonates pound for pound with A Course in Miracles. I found nothing out of harmony with the message of the course. And by this time, of course, I've been studying it for 18 years, and I know it inside and out. I've, um, for the last eight years, I've gone through the lessons every year and read a section of the text alongside that daily without missing a day. I haven't missed a lesson in eight years. And I, write, I might add on that I, I had the same experience of reading your book. I kept saying, this is, this is the course. This is the course. This yes. Is the course. And it didn't go off course at all. And that's, that's why we're here together. Yes, that is the tying factor that, like John said, it's, it's taking a leap because not only are we just, it feels like we're just taking baby steps towards accepting um, people of other nationalities different from our own or yeah. other cultures. It feels like we're still there, but we're not because here you guys are and you know you're not that way. You wouldn't be sitting here if your mind wasn't open and you weren't past all that. You know, nobody here has a prejudice against a human body because you're here because you know better. And we want to keep fostering that and strengthening each other and unifying in that universal love that bodies do not dictate who you are and what you're driven to in people is their love and light and and you can feel that so my whole thing now is using my other vision my christ vision and i discovered in the past year that that other vision is leading with your heart and instead of seeing a person no matter how bad they are i go but where is their stillness because we share a stillness with god and now I'm going to reach for that with my heart and ignore what their mouth is saying and their body is doing because I know they're filtering through their ego. I want to feel the truth in them and please let that step forward because that's what I want to see. And that has healed so many relationships, whether the person moved away that was giving me trouble or they shifted. Um, it, it's been miraculous all around. There's always a shift that comes when you shift how you see them and you ask to see only that still quiet part of them that's in communion with God and has never left God. And just forget about all the quit thinking the negative stuff. I just want to know their love and light. And that's what I want to commune with. And boy, oh boy, that steps forward every time. One so of the things that I've noticed, take the, for example, these young guys have been they did the mass shootings, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, that seems to be, they're really far away and there's a lot of condemnation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no, mm -hmm. look for the light. There's a light. Mm -hmm. There's nobody on this planet mm -hmm. that doesn't have a light even, even these mm -hmm. who are. So when I, 
when on that note, so initially, initially, when you see something horrific, you're like in shock and you're going, put that person away or take away their guns or do whatever physically to their body that they deserve. But then I go, wait, wait, wait. Remember, we're all one mind in God. So this means that this person is an aspect of me, my one mind in desperate need of healing. And healing is achieved by a shift in perception. I want their love to step forward. They are so desperate that they think that shooting other people will heal what's hurting them. And it never will. They're regressive, but it's an aspect of my mind. I take full ownership for what I see. And if I see this, that means there's a a dark corner in need of healing in me. I will not contribute to that hate. I will not contribute to the fear. And I literally, I don't even know when the last time was that I felt fear of anything. I, I quote the C word. I don't know if we can say that, but you know, um, people are like, should you get the, get the, get the, this, you know, in the arm or not. And, And there's such controversy because we're a pharmacy and we were giving those to people. And my answer every time was do the thing that gives you the least amount of fear. If you're afraid of the thing, getting it either way, whether it's in the, a syringe or in a cough, whatever way for him it comes. And you know what? I um, was exposed to it three times in my household. My husband had it one month, my daughter had it another month and my son had it. And I actually ate my son's half uneaten cream puff the day before he found out he tested positive. And I was like, I'm going to get it for sure now. And I never did. No, I never did. And they all had um, mild to moderate symptoms and got over it in a week or so. And they're all okay now. And and there's no long hauler symptoms or anything. But I think too, it's because I kept thinking, well, they're not that illness. They're not their body. I'm just going to focus on how strong their light is. Just like I focus on how strong my mother's light is. I know she won't live forever because even Jesus left this planet physically. Uh, His body got left and he became, you know, his magnificent self and and so it's just part of our process but i want just Mm -hmm. that to be the best outcome possible given the circumstances and that's always my prayer for everything let the best possible outcome come out of this um and i will not stand in the way of whatever that is with by wishing for something to be different Mm -hmm. i once heard these words in my head that true forgiveness is to stop wishing the past was different. Right. When you stop wishing things were different, you've forgiven it because you're at peace with it. So, That's of course, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. We're only like five minutes away from our first break. Would you believe that at first break, the only break we're going to have? And in that time, give us a little morsel of what's in the next book about what Martha is sharing with us that seems significant to you. Um, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was so shocked by all of it. Um, when she got into talking about the variations that God has created physical beings, that the circumstances that um, the main humanoid people you will encounter, some will look identical to us and some will be very different. But um, then she talked about graduating each step of the way as we move inward. It is a journey but it is a journey without distance. You're constantly shifting your level of love for God. And I think, well, I can't even conceive of moving forward from where I am because I don't know where forward goes. And um, she said, you just have to trust your forward progress once you've decided you're going to join with love and light and oneness and stop fighting against unity. And the one of when she took the turn into the visitors we've had on this planet helping humanity, the Adam and Eve story um, took me by surprise. And um, I, I, it's a long story because it's the better half of the third last part of the book or so, maybe even halfway through the middle. Um, she tells the story, the true story of Adam and Eve and how long they were actually on the planet and how we have little bits of it in our Bible and in our historical stories. But um, obviously that's the best we can do when we had no written language at the time. And we're talking about things that they didn't have a way to describe. Um, And the Adam and Eve story and the future plan for earth is to get us back on track because there was a failure there and uh, only partial success 
and Jesus came to help initiate or ignite um, the awakening of humanity. This process actually started 2,000 years ago, and now it's full tilt. Uh, I uh, the the Course in Miracles I'm going to say was really the next push forward from where we were 2,000 years ago, and I feel like everything started shifting. Even if you're a non-Course student you can feel this happening. There's a momentum here, a shift, and there's energy moving, and there's change afoot. Um, there is change afoot, and it's happening in our lifetime. And Martha said one of those changes will be then at some point open contact with other races of beings from other galaxies, um, that you don't need a physical ship to travel. You don't need to physically move through time and space. They have figured out how to interdimensionally shift but they can't meet us till we're at a high enough vibration to see them because there's that whole thing um, she goes into and and I asked multiple times when I could see her and she said if you came to my planet right now you would just see a desolate landscape but their planet which she showed me in my mind's eye was beautiful and green just like earth um, but she said it's only 50 percent water and their ocean is a third more has a third more salinity to it, a third more salty. And um, I do have a, a weird story about how I, I went there astrally one time and I, I thought it was a dream. <laughs> and, and to my chagrin, to my embarrassment, I was sent right back because of uh, I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> and wow. I ended up in one of her oceans and uh, was rescued by a gentleman there. And then their little family is like, you're not supposed to be here. Don't do that without anyone helping you get back to earth. And, and I woke up in my body and I was uh, embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> that what what a weird thing to have a dream about but uh no martha assured me that no your higher self said you wanted to come here and and i tried and i made it but i landed in not the right spot so um but yes um maybe there is so much out there about, maybe we should talk a moment about this world being a dream Just yes right yes now. this this density this third dimension as some people call it um, is a projection of, of the level of love we're capable of. And right now, people like you and I in this group here, we are shifting that. And I always think, well, these things should just happen boop, like magic. But the Course says, I will never rip you out of your reality. It'll always be gentle and loving. And so we're going through this kind of what feels like slow, but it isn't. It's at Mach no. 20. You know, it is going at lightning speed. And um, so we're going to see a shift. And what you're going to see is a separation of the separation. The worst stuff is going to get worse and the best stuff is going to get better. And at some point you're going to see only the good. And so now, you know, I know the course talks about laughter too, and we're going to laugh at this whole dream at some point and go how funny. And I thought, oh, murder and starvation and nuclear weapons and, you know, all that stuff. And, and, um, but I'm giving there where I'll go through my Facebook news feed. And one day I saw not too long ago, a few days ago, there's giant snails in Florida and they spread intestinal parasites and eat all the vegetation. They found two and they put some area of Florida under quarantine. And I suppose they're pets that people, you know, they're from Africa. And I thought, oh my God, now what? We have giant snails. And then just scrolling through the different things that people think are important that the news puts out, you know, the you know, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and things like that. And, and even the shootings, it's like, okay, when will people discover that is not going to work? You can't just go around shooting people. That's not going to solve your problems. And I'm starting to feel dismissive almost because it's so much it's like almost laughable because everything is being thrown at us all all at once we've had you know um disease with the pandemic we have war we have all this stuff gas prices are going through the roof and everything that can possibly go wrong is going wrong and i just think well let it come let this fall down around me in pieces because it's okay it's supposed to. It was never built to last anyway. Just let it fall down because on the on the base of that rubble, people like us 54 people sitting here are going to build a new earth. And we're doing it with one positive, loving, unified thought at a time. There was a time when um, 
there was like, a, I don't know what was happening, but I said, you know, what if it happened that there was a nuclear war? I said, I do know where there's fresh water that comes out of ground springs in the river by our house. I said, we've got chickens and we've got horses. I said, we'd have a way to travel and we've got food. And I started kind of panicking, like, how would we defend our little island, uh, our farm, like defend our resources? Yes. And I thought, how would we keep, you know, people from looting and taking what little we have if, if we were one of the last people living and there's people around us starving? And I said, Holy Spirit, what would we do? How would we protect ourselves? There's only so many bullets, you know. And the Holy Spirit said, for heaven's sake, you would share because many hands make light work and you'd have more minds that are smarter than yours to help you invent things to help you survive. You have to rebuild the community. You don't wall yourself off. You let everyone in so that you can give everyone a job and you figure it out together because the more people you have, the better. And I went, oh, duh. <laughs> Why was I even going down that bad road of, you know, hunker down in your bunker and, and hide from people in a bomb shelter or something? No, you welcome them with open arms, right. rebuild a society. And, and it's that mentality that's going to split away where we're going to see that it's better to help than to Absolutely. try and covet. Yes. The ego wants to covet everything, but it's better to give. Yes. So we were actually at our, our break point at, at this point. We're going to make it a little different. At this point, we normally bring in questions or normally Bud will talk about uh, what's been going on in the chat. We're still going to do that. But I'd like to go on for another 10 minutes or so with Beth. Just I ask her if she would talk about there's so much. This is so incredibly rich, uh, but pick out a couple of gems that she'd like to share. She said she knew exactly what that would be. So uh, go ahead, Beth, and, uh, and share that. And then we'll break into, uh, Bud will tell us about what's going on. Then we'll have questions after that. So go ahead. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yes. Um, one of my favorite things was initially before um, Martha came into my life, one of the strange experiences I had that prepared me for it, and she later brought up why this happened. Um, we were on a hiking trip, just my husband and two kids, and then we were there with another friend of his and his son, and we were hiking up the Superior Hiking Trail in Minnesota, which is backcountry hiking. You hike in with what you have, and that's all you get. You don't. There's no campsite except an area where you can put your tent that you brought with you and your way off grid and we're going to spend two nights up there uh, along the superior hiking trail and on the hike in it was a four mile hike in to get to our first spot we were going to camp for the night and three times on that hike in I had what I can only call a love burst in my heart and hmm. I, I wasn't thinking anything I wasn't doing anything I'm just walking with my backpack and all of a sudden my heart just filled with this profound love and it was like an orgasm in my chest <laughs> like if you can imagine that orgasm physical you know sexual orgasm but in your heart where it just exploded with love and it would last for several minutes and that happened three times and I thought, am I having a heart attack? And I thought, no, because no one has ever described a heart attack as feeling supremely loving and beautiful and wonderful. <laughs> and, and you didn't want it to end, you know, <laughs> no one. And I, I know those are painful. And I can't think of one thing anyone has ever described that would match this that was something bad or wrong. I just don't know what that was. And so we got back to camp. And I checked my Fitbit, which I wear, it keeps track of my heart rate. My resting heart rate was around 69 or 70. When we started the hike, I was not in the best shape of my life. I've ran a couple half marathons and things like that. Um, I've always been a runner. And the lowest I've ever been able to get my heart rate was in the 50s. But that's when you do a lot of work. You're training hard and your heart is very efficient. And it was not. It was like 68 to 70 sometimes in the lower 70s for my resting heart rate. And that's what it was when I left the house that morning. That night when I checked my phone and was checking my heart rate and just looking at it, see my stats, my resting heart rate was 57. And I went, what in the actual heck and heck? How did my resting heart rate go down? I was working hard today. I was ex extent, you know, carrying a 30 pound backpack up and down steep hills. I was working hard, you could see all my elevations. And I thought, how is my resting heart rate? How did it drop? 
like almost 20 points. That only happens after weeks and months of serious running and cardio. Thought, wow, that's weird. And that night when I laid in my tent, um, I was exhausted and I had my kids were in the tent with me and, and um, I was starting to fall asleep and I had this vision of uh, extraterrestrial come into my view in my mind's eye. And I thought, oh, I'm dreaming. And I thought, but that's so weird because I can feel it was the same thing, a lucid dream. I could feel my backpack or my uh, sleeping bag around me. I knew I was in a tent and I knew we were camping and I knew I was in my, my sleeping bag laying on the ground face up. And yet here was this beautiful light blue shining being with the, the big dark eyes and their face came around um, to a chin, just a thin line for a mouth and just a small pointed nose. She had hair, white hair with bangs that kind of cut across like this and very long, beautiful white hair. And she was a pale blue and she was glowing. And I said, who are you? And she said, my name is Aya, A-Y-A. And I said, why are you here in front of me in my mind? And she said, I'm introducing myself. I'm going to be your contact personality when we make first contact with your planet in, your, in, in my lifetime, in our lifetime, as in in the next decade soon. And I was like, holy buckets. And she zoomed out because I wanted to see her whole body and she had thin limbs but she was sitting on something with her legs crossed and then I wanted to zoom in and see her face up really close and then she smiled and again I felt this profound love it was like I'd met my mother my sister and my best friend all in one person and I just felt nothing but love and goodness emanating from her and me towards her and she had nothing more to say other than I'm just introducing myself so you know who I am when we meet in the physical in your lifetime. So at some point, I guess I fully expect a UFO to land in my backyard. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And then it shifted to another individual and he was a sandy brown color. And he had been in one of my, my dreams when I had had a UFO experience as a child. And here he was again, the same individual, hadn't seen him since I was a little kid. He's the one that I could smell. He smelled like sandalwood incense and cinnamon with kind of a hint of matches. I don't know how to describe it, but that's the closest that's I can good. get. <laughs> I can, I like, I can, I could smell like what was matches, but it was sweet, like sandalwood, but there was like a cinnamon undertone and it like matched the color of his skin in my mind when I thought of sandalwood and cinnamon. Like he looks like how he smells. And same thing, dark eyes, thin mouth. Um, and I said, he didn't say anything to me. I just knew he felt ancient, like older than anything I'd ever met. And I heard Aya say, this is my mentor. He's who taught me all I know about spirituality. And I just, we're just introducing ourselves. And it all winked out. And I was whoop, fully awake in my sleeping bag and thought, holy buckets, that, what a weird day. What a weird day. And I'm having the best time. We have beautiful weather and those three heart things that happened. Well, later than when I was talking to Martha, I was asking her about relationships in her people. How have they evolved? Like, is there romance? How do you have children? Um, because they're amphibious, it does involve eggs, but they have them in pairs, either of two or four, and then that's it, just once in their life. Sex does not come into play except for that one time. And I thought, you only do that once in your life? Like, that sounds terrible. <laughs> and, and, and she said, no, 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 no. She said, we have a different way of loving each other. And this is where the course comes in, that it's not about the body. And she said, um, when we have birthdays, and it actually was my birthday at this time, and I'd woken up to thoughts about, hey, today's my birthday. And this was back in 2021, when I was writing, just meeting Martha. And um, she said, oh, and she was instantly in my mind. And she's when I woke up, and she said, I've got two birthday gifts for you. One is I will tell you how we celebrate birthdays in my world. And also, I will tell you when we will meet in the physical. And I said, how did you know today was my birthday? Are you just scanning my mind? Are you invading my privacy? And she said, no, you woke up and said, 
today's my birthday and I heard you and you could feel me. You knew I was there. So when you thought those things, I was there. And, and I said, well, I guess I better be careful what I think about you. What if I think something mean or terrible or awful? I, I don't want you to hear those things. And she said, only your loving thoughts can be shared. Again, Course in Miracles, only love can be truly extended to another being. Don't worry about thinking awful things. that will never reach me. I'll never hear it because I'm not on that frequency. If you're in that state of mind, I can't hear you. And I said, oh, okay, good. I haven't, but you never know. And so she said, since our children are born in groups, she goes, it's similar to fish on your planet. They're born in like schools, except we have individual couples. We like to keep our children all the same age and they're born in groups. It helps with learning. We also have undersea maneuvers we do as families. If everybody's the same age when they're hatched, <laughs> then it's perfect. And their children reach maturity in like two years. It, it's a very fast growth rate. And when they're born, they can be born on land or in water. And she said they're born fully conscious. They're able to fend for themselves. And they're just smaller adults that need guidance and teaching. But she said um, they're fully aware of their connection to God and source and to the community. Uh, they're born with love and light and fully aware of it. And she said for birthdays, because children are so precious, she said um, that they go around giving each other love bursts in the chest. And she said, you'll, you'll like project it at them directly and you'll get this big blossom of love. And she said, I did that to you three times when, when um, in your life. And I said, was that on that hiking trip? And she said, yes. Uh, you were given three love bursts in your chest to elevate your frequency so you could meet Aya on that astral plane when you were half asleep in your sleeping bag. You couldn't have traveled there if you hadn't been elevated. We just had to give you a little kick, a little boost. And, and that's why your heart rate lowered, because everything strengthens with love. The heart muscle literally came into perfect condition shape. And that lasted, that low heart rate lasted for about two weeks. And then it lost its, um, it, my heart rate went back up to my resting heart rate of being out of shape <laughs> or in less good shape. But it went into peak condition from that love burst because the heart muscle responded to that shot of love. So I experienced kind of a physical miracle when that love burst went into my chest, because it not only strengthened my vibration of my whole spirit, but it my body reacted, and my heart was temporarily given perfect conditioning um, to be able to contact or receive contact from a higher vibration being who is elevated by love, you know, that she couldn't quite come down to where I was at. So I had to be pushed up a little bit. And um, so they will literally run around on the birthday of the whole group of children and everyone will just be laughing and running around giving each other these love bursts and and I said so you know she said they partner for life and she said but there's no divorce or anything like that and there's no restraints there's no paper you sign that you're married you just decide this is the person I want to team up with and you don't separate because there isn't anyone else that's any different or less or more loving than who you're with everyone loves everyone equally and that's when I said so is there any romance and she said what you think of as love is the connection of a physical body through sex bodies cannot be one not like you can in spirit and she said the way we make love through spirit would literally blow your mind if I gave you the full force of it right now you would just you would die you wouldn't be able to handle it. Your circuits would overload. She said, you have no idea how we make love and how amazing that is. And it has nothing to do with the body at all. And it is the most fulfilling, satisfying thing. And um, it's shared as a gift with another person and there's no jealousy. And so when birthday time comes, I go around being loving to everybody. And I thought, wow, if I got just a small bit of it when I was on that hiking trip, I can't imagine what the full force would even feel right. like because that was overwhelming. Um, so okay. that's just another thing from the book about how their wonderful. evolved society yeah. goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's switch now to uh, Bud making some observations about what's coming up in the chat, and then uh, we'll see where see where we are at this point. 
Bye, we've Jeremy. got a number of uh, we've got a number of really great questions and a, a lot of love going on in the chat. Um, first question was from Alice. Beth, what was Ronnie Whitson's role in helping you publish your first book? So I told John this story when we connected on Friday before, you know, prepping for this. Um, I had an editor that was the same as John Mundy's. I didn't know who to edit or have edit my first book. I just knew it needed to be looked at. I didn't know if the content was going to even be publishable. Was this something that should be a book and I read on the internet to go look through other books that are like yours and see if the author thanked their editor and then go find that person when you get their name and so uh, John is the only one of the all the books I have that thanked his editor so I always say thank you John because <laughs> I found this gentleman named Michael Fragnito he edited my book and then we got it to the point where it was publishable and he thought it was great. I rewrote it with the conversations instead of me preaching. It was me learning and displaying how I went through the whole process of coming to all these wonderful epiphanies and conclusions that have transformed my life. And he said, OK, now you need an agent because uh, like Hay House won't even look at a manuscript without an agent representative. They don't just take manuscripts say you need an agent to have a foot in the door he sent me a list of names and I barely looked at it. I got the emails like 20 different people and I just glanced at it and closed it and thought I don't even know how I'm going to pick who I, I don't even know where to start but okay but I have names that's good I uh, went to bed that night and I had a dream here again it's like you said with uh Helen it was a lot of dreams a lot of things come through when you're sleeping and not everything is prophetic because there, there's some dreams you know they're just a bunch of nonsense but I, I in this dream I was riding my riding lawnmower in the backyard mowing and I remember feeling very satisfied I was going really well and a man in in a black suit a three-piece suit with sunglasses the whole nine yards looked like men in black from that Will Smith movie Looked just like that. Walked up to my lawnmower, did this, cut the engine. So I turned off my lawnmower. This is a dream. And he said, the person you need to be your agent is Ivan. And I said, okay. And he walked away. And so I turned on the lawnmower and I woke up and I thought that was weird. Oh, I'm going to see if there's an Ivan on that list of names of agents. There was no Ivan, but there was an Ivor, I-V-O-R. His wife is Ronnie Whitson who was the person who annotated the Course in Miracles, <laughs> I reached out to her, said, I have this course book, and then it was history ever since. But literally, I was approached in my dream and told off that list of like 10 or 20 people, this is, you need this person. And um, that forged the relationship. And Ronnie became my editor and, and uh, correspondent for all my writing. And, and well, like Ronnie may be on. I'm not sure. I sent her the link this morning and she said she was going to try to come on for a while. Ronnie, awesome. if you're here, you could say hi. Yeah. I didn't see her name, but she was going to make yeah. it happen. Okay. So, yeah, that's that story. That's how I even came to have Ronnie and, and Ivor as my my agent and my publisher and my editor and all around uh, great people. Yeah, they and are. Help, help me with everything. None of this would be happening without them. So I talked to Ronnie this morning, by the way, and she's really in very, very excited about your book. Feels good really good about it. And I, I feel really good about it. Glenn, I think, is on with us. I know Glenn feels good about it. So uh, we've already got a lot of good feeling here. That's amazing. Good, good. That's Wonderful good. to hear. Thank you. Well, well, speaking of Glenn, he had a question. And oh, okay. he asks, uh, early in your new book, Martha describes the human situation now as being in a delicate transition you quoted martha as saying quote you are in transition from your current understanding of reality to a new understanding can you expand on this especially how awareness of et's can help and how this can help us connect with the heart's love yes so that love burst i talked about you know, it came from another dimension. That's just not floating around in our physical. There's nothing you can drink or a pill you can take that can reproduce that. There's nothing. So that came from another space. And and um, what Martha's talking about is you will be moving into an energy field 
that is unlike what you're used to and how the course talks about projection begets perception that we're projecting our thoughts into the world it is literally true and that oh. and it isn't just oh think positive and fight against it wow. like i'm sad but i'm going to think positive and get through this no it is always try to shift your heart mm. your heart is your actual voice and it doesn't lie when you don't like someone it, it doesn't matter how many times you say but i'm gonna love them i'm gonna love them you can't if you don't like them your heart doesn't lie but you can shift your heart by telling it yes you don't like them you don't have to accept shootings and accept that these people have done these things but you can say there is another way to see them that that isn't part of the equation. There is a light in them. There is an inner stillness that we share as part of one mind. And as you move into that thinking more and more and more, we literally, the people in this group that are taking this in and accepting these things from the course are pulling humanity with us. We're carrying the new reality forward. And whether people are kicking and screaming or not, the ones that are least resistant or that are kind of ambivalent even are coming with us. And there will be some that bail, so we're going to see deaths, or a shift into um, where there are just people who are not in our lives anymore that were a negative influence. They're going to just naturally move out of our life. Um, and so, if you see shifts in your relationships, that maybe, maybe you had a marriage and it's on its way out. Well, let it let it do its thing because that person maybe isn't a part of the same frequency you're in anymore. Maybe that relationship will heal and they'll step up, um, but let it run its course. And you're going to see that a world wide as we move into this higher frequency of love where peace is prevalent. And it, it's what the, I don't want to say the word new agers, but these people outside of the course or within the course, I hear it on the internet that they're talking about shifting to a new age um, and a new earth there literally is a transition coming and we can't do it alone. We have all kinds of helpers besides Jesus reaching out to Helen. There are extraterrestrials who are highly evolved spiritually who are reaching out to individuals, um, not unlike Martha and myself. And they're helping us get people ready for a new experience of integrating with the intergalactic family of other beings that are on our same wavelength. And as we rise, there's more and more and more people, not less, but more. So think what we have to incorporate into our worldview and our belief to know how not alone we are and how varied uh, life can express itself and be able to just mentally prepare so we're not shocked all of a sudden. Because like it says in the course, you're not going to be shocked all of a sudden. It's a gradual process of growth. It would be cruel to just throw you into the light without any warning, like someone yeah. living in a cave all their life, and then, you know, you'd be blinded. You, you, it's shocking and terrifying. And so in order to not be terrified, we're being gently introduced. And this book with Martha is one of the first gentle introductions into the idea of what's out there, of yeah. what, what has happened to Earth in the past. And what's coming is, is this new healing, this new growth. And um, it's, we can't be given it all at once because it would be a shock and it would cause more fear than um, joy. <laughs> if, if it was all downloaded at once, it'd be too much. So. Anything else, bud? Yeah. Thank you, Beth. Um, there is a couple of questions. Uh, so is Martha or any of her compatriots in touch with other earthlings? I don't think so. I, I had never heard of her kind of being before. And I, for me, all I can see is that she reached out to me. And I started to ask her in my book about other beings and when they're going to come to earth, because she said she wasn't. They're too high up in density. Uh, they're uh, uh, their frequency is too high, we wouldn't even be able to see them. She said, no, there are ones like Aya who are coming. And I said, well, when and who are they? And she said, that is for them to reveal. I, I'm not allowed to interfere on that level because I can't prematurely reveal things for someone else. And so she's very private and it comes down to just her and I. And if there are other people on her planet in contact with humans, I don't think I'm 
it's none of my business <laughs> is the feeling I get like, mind your own backyard, mind your own garden, you worry about you and don't try to insert yourself in other narratives. That's for them and let them have their special time, whatever that is. And it's kind of the general respectful attitude of the higher realm. Like don't try and stomp on other people's info, let them have their own reveal. And if you're to be incorporated, you'll be notified, you'll be brought in, you'll meet the right people, you'll get in touch with the right individuals. And if you're to be part of another person's narrative, you'll be invited and you'll know it. And it'll be a natural occurrence. It won't be a just nosy busybody. <laughs> What's so. exciting though is where these overlaps, overlap the overlaps. I mean, it, it comes here, it comes here, mm -hmm. but then there are these junctions and that's where it gets really exciting. That, that, yes. That's a confirmation. It's like yes. reading your book is how you say that it's conjuncts with the Course in Miracles. But this is a whole another dimension. Mm -hmm. this is right here. We're, we're, you know, the, the, what the Course is, the Course is a great psychology. It explains to us why we got into this mess. It tells us how we can get out of it if we're willing to engage in the practice to do that. Mm -hmm. But now what you're doing here, that's still another expansion on our mm -hmm. consciousness, which I, I am totally in agreement with you about something is really happening. It's very clear. And even the kind of rotten stuff that seems to be mm -hmm. going around with politics or something, mm -hmm. uh, that's even a part of the, the, I don't know, what, the dark side. I don't know what it, it almost feels like there's this desperate last ditch effort on the part of the darkness or the yeah. regressives anyone out there who's regressive and is controlling things for everyone else i feel like it's all a, the war is a last ditch effort of desperation the, the the pandemic was a last ditch effort just one last ditch effort to make us all so scared and to stop the light that's coming but there's no stopping it and it's gonna it's wow. we're gonna have a it's gonna rampage through no matter what and transform um and so anything you see now to me it has a last ditch effort of desperation to it right. to try and make humanity uh scared and cow down and not look within and to keep focusing on without and all these big problems and i'm just not buying it i'm not i mean my heart goes out i'll donate money i'll help in any way i can but i'm not going to emotionally feed it or buy right. into that narrative mm -hmm. well, you know so much of what happens in life anyhow the, there is a, some sort of when Helen didn't start getting the course until after Bill confronted her with, there's got to be another way, you know, we mm -hmm. got to get along here. And mm -hmm. then there's this sudden shift of you're right. I'll help you find it. Mm -hmm. And, and there, and, and it starts happening. So mm -hmm. this is a part of for this class that I'm teaching beginning on Tuesday, we're using uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Well, Christian's got to go through the sloth of despond before he begins to, you know, it's like get some of this burden off of his back mm -hmm. so that he begins to lighten up. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay, see that. That's normal for all of us. Yep. But anything else? And then we go to a couple of questions here. Yeah, there are really just a couple of, of, of minor, <clears throat> excuse me, minor questions. Um, uh, are you experiencing any ascension symptoms? Hmm. Well, you know, I've always wondered what those were. <laughs> and I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I feel more awake than I ever have, because wow. I feel like my eyes are so open to the truth, and that I have become so quick to respond with truth um, in any given situation. And I keep getting these little trials and tests every now and then. Um, something will come up with an angry customer at work or something, and I'm getting faster and faster at letting, uh, stepping aside and letting the Holy Spirit see for me instead of reacting reactively out of the ego. And um, I Elizabeth, don't. I think that's true for anybody who's doing yes, the course of miracles. Yes, if you're yes, doing the it's course a process. You're taking the course seriously. You're going to have this feeling that things are improved Diff in your own yes, mind. Yes. You're seeing better, you know, yes. less of this stuff that's dragging you yes. down. And therefore, the connectivity is just automatic. You're just, mm -hmm. you're there for people. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong. What a great day. I'm mm -hmm. really glad I'm doing the things I'm doing. And there that is a strong natural. natural and joy has become natural. I wake yeah. in the morning with a happy expectancy of, I don't know what's going to happen today, but I know I'm going to love it. <laughs> and yeah. that's kind of my general attitude. I don't know what's happening today. 
I know I'm going to love it. And, <laughs> and it just let it unfold. And the smallest things in life have become so delicious. Yeah. Um, the feel of a soft blanket when I'm watching TV with oh, my husband yeah. or walking along just down the driveway, I'm noticing things I never noticed, like how fresh the air is or how soft the breeze feels right. or how beautiful nature is. I never noticed the details. Oh, so there so much is stepping forward. That's beautiful and delicious. And it, it so, um, Whatever those uh, symptoms of ascension are, I know that I'm moving in a very positive direction. All pain and discomfort that I had in my body with whatever little things has all fallen away. And in the middle of the night, I used to have something I'd call my middle of the night um, despair. I'd wake up at two, three in the morning to go to the bathroom sometimes, and I would just feel hopeless. It would be a weird kind of hopelessness. And you could call it anxiety or depression, but it was literally a feeling of like everything's gone wrong. And I didn't know why I had that. Physiologically, I knew because as a pharmacist and having had um, classes on the human body and, and physiology and things that go wrong, I know that in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, sleep is so important because you're producing, you're replenishing your serotonin levels in your mind. A lot of depression is just stems from lack of sleep. Because when you sleep, your serotonin replenishes and you wake up refreshed. But in the middle of the night, if it's not doing that, you're going to feel despair instead. Wow. So I knew the physiologic because that's they go to their lowest in the middle of the night because they're zapped to their lowest and then they replenish. So I knew physiologically, but why was that even happening? That phenomenon has gone away. I wake up in the middle of the night now to use the bathroom once in a while. I, it's gone. I don't know where it went or how it went away, but it, it's just gone. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, What's the purpose of the whole course? You know, on the very, very first page of the Course in Miracles, what does it say? The purpose of to remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. Yes. So as these blocks yes. do begin to fall away, and it's mm -hmm. just inevitable that when they do, you begin to feel lighter. Yes. You know, you're yes. not doing what, what, what burden, you know, what, yeah, what, there's what nothing wrong. Nothing's yeah. happening to what, me right what now. Difficulty? Yeah. <laughs> We're sitting here together, having a nice talk with a group of people and that nothing else is yeah. happening. Negative. <laughs> and you get to share that. That's the thing You're about the group. Of people. You get to share it with the world or mm -hmm. anybody you meet, anybody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. The pharmacist at the drugstore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you have a relationship. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, speaking of relationships, it, it was another thing that dawned on me in this past year or so that you're in relationship with everything, right. be it uh, the stapler at work that wouldn't it would jam constantly. And that's <laughs> when I discovered I'm having a bad relationship with this stapler. <laughs> And I thought, I'm going to try and see it divinely. And I thought, really, when it's sitting on the cup and I'm not touching it, it's at peace. It's so peaceful. Stapler, <laughs> you are so, I feel your stillness. You have the stillness of God. And I, and I just started to feel this like oh, love God. go out and the stapler hasn't jammed since. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm handling it more gently. But it works with if you're worried about your money. You have a bad relationship with your money. Let your money be at peace. Don't worry <laughs> about what your money is doing. Yeah. Just be at peace, but let it rest. Let it be there still. You, you know, it's anything, whether it's a stapler, a, a coffee maker, a human being, or a car. Yeah, your car. That car you're in a relationship. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But sh should we go on to the questions online? Sure. Yeah, okay. okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right, Tucker, you're on first. Of course, now the challenge, Doctor, will be to actually create no, a question. No, no, I, 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 I uh, <laughs> yes. So, so uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I have to salute John for all the, the great stuff that he brings us. And holy buckets, you are really um, uh, uh, put me in gear, Miss uh, Miss Gear. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, 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 one one of the things that I, I love the Minnesota accent, and uh, one of my. Uh, 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 Chippewa Indian friends who wrote a book called uh, the the sentence Louise Erdrich is from Minneapolis. How close are you there? I'm just an hour south of Minneapolis. I okay, live so, uh, so, so a couple you, miles. Mm -hmm. So you 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 need to talk to her because she wrote a, a, a thing about uh, a, a ghost coming back and and the sentence is the, the number one book on the New York Review book and she went to Dartmouth on one of my. Uh, 
grandfather's scholarships there. Wow. Uh, so, uh, what, what was her book called? Uh, it's called the sentence, like the uh, sentence. It, but it's it's a uh, it's a uh, quadruple pun. Uh, she was sentenced to jail. She her uh, she had the sense of COVID. Her husband had the sentence. Uh, all, all these things, and and she's been sentenced. Her her ghost in the book. Uh, it, the name of the bookstore is the Birchwood Bookstore in Minneapolis. Okay. And so so that's number one. Number two, uh, uh, you you, you uh, have. Uh, exposed me yet again to a wonderful thing where I, uh, 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 in the 60s, I went to Nepal and, and India, and uh, I, I was a big uh, psychedelic user in the, the 60s and 70s. And, and uh, um, now I have been reconnected. I'm in, in a nursing home, as John will tell you. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of things make my ego go back and forth uh, on, on stuff there. But uh, what, I, what I really have gotten into is the fact that plant-based medicines um, uh, are, 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 are a way that are getting people to, uh, uh, sure. to uh, be part of a, a, uh, uh, this, this sure. new revolution that's going on, whether it's humanities team, whether it's Mind Valley, whether it's um, any of these things, and um, I, my question to you is, is that you seem so wonderfully upbeat and and everything, and and uh, uh, I, 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 for some reason, uh, I'm not able to actually share my enthusiasm for this this new um, uh, uh, breakthrough that's going to be happening. There's the the, uh, there, uh, all these great movies have come out uh, about the 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 sixth uh, uh, son, the the the, the uh, Mayan calendar, the age mm -hmm. of Aquarius. Uh, you said that you you've been doing the tarot cards, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, there, there's so many things that people can plug into mm -hmm. to do stuff. However, what do you do when people kind of go, "You're nuts"? What do you? What do <laughs> I mean, that, you, that's what do you a mean, good Martha? question. What do you mean, yes. Martha, Martha, Martha yes. with, with gills and, and mm -hmm. uh, I know, I know. I I thought I was no, nuts and, and, too, and, and it's coming. Called the Gaia, which if you haven't been on Gaia yet with Regina Meredith, you need to be on it because she interviews uh, about seventy different interviews. It's called G A I A, the the, uh, the uh, website that. And, and she interviews all kinds of people like you yeah, <laughs> yeah. that, that, and, that are, have, and, and have interviewed, uh, you know, have been with people from outer space. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and it, it's it, what, what's so uh, amazing, and then I'll shut up, uh, is, that, uh, uh, is that, that, that it's now so acceptable. Mm -hmm. Ancient aliens on TV, on the History Channel, mm -hmm. all, all this stuff. That, that things are now we're, it, it, we're broadening, broadening to do that. And I'm just wondering, what do you do when people kind of go, you're nuts? Okay. So, you know, that came up even before this. So I was hesitant to uh, start even putting this into a book. And that's why I ran some stuff by Glenn before I even came out. And since he was receptive and so supportive, that encouraged me. He played a big part in my encouragement because I thought I'm going to get either laughed or scorned, but nothing positive, you know. But even before that, when I was writing my first book, I thought even just the fact I'm claiming to hear an inner voice or feel the words, it would be a feeling that I translate into words. And that's how I took down, um, took down my writing. Every time I come across a, a regressive comment on the internet, because I'm on Facebook, I'm on YouTube, um, you hit all the people, you know, and every now and then there is a very negative comment and very debasing. And I'd ask the Holy Spirit. And it's always been the same answer. When I say, what do I do with this person, this comment? What do I do? Do I? And the Holy Spirit said, remember, you're not there for them. You're here for the harvest. You're here for the fruit that's ripe and ready. Anything that's not ready, you overlook and let it hang. You just let it hang. So I let the comments hang. 
right. I'm not there for them. I'm here for you. That's I'm right. here for the receptive people and the receptive people are here for me. I'm here to hear your stories and your things that encourages me. The, the harvest is the people who are already ready and we've been waiting. And, and yes, there's tons of stuff out there. Use your discernment, use your inner discernment. If someone says the earth is flat, use your common sense. <laughs> you know, there, if something sounds hokey and fishy and stupid, it probably is. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but if something rings in your heart, like, okay, wow. And even if that's not true, that sure is a really uplifting story that I feel good listening to. That's all you need. You don't need to believe it one way or the other. And I'm not here to convert believers or convince anyone of anything, but I am here to help build and elevate people's love. Right. And, um, and that is, that's it. And if no one, if you don't want that, then I just say, well, I'll let you hang. <laughs> Let's go to Alice so, and see what Alice and then Dave, um, go ahead, Alice. Um, yeah, I appreciated hearing your story. It reminded me a lot of things that I experienced 30 years ago um, during the harmonic convergence when I mm -hmm. suddenly opened up psychically in one day and had all five senses open up. I had encounters with ETs. I met a number of other people who had encounters with ETs. Uh, geez, I guess it's, it's 35 years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I thought a lot of there was going to come toward the millennium and all these things would start mm -hmm. to happen. And, and you know, I think this is all ancient stuff too. It's like mm -hmm. the, all these things coming out. It's like, there's a certain timing when people are ready to hear it. And, and I liked mm -hmm. what you said, you know, when, when they're ready, you know, it's the whole thing when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. And this was before I was obviously being guided to, to the course and working with Jesus directly and hearing his messages and studying the course intently and do every day for a number of years mm -hmm. now and listen to that inner guidance. And I take a lot of notes mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and at some point, hopefully get my books done too, that are all about my own inner guidance. So I appreciated, and I had encountered Ronnie Whitson. So I started researching this morning, uh, how you got your book published. And then I asked the question about Ronnie. So there seems to be an interesting connection there. Mm -hmm. She'd helped me a number of years ago um, when I was starting to learn how to study the course more in depth with her searchable program. So Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to connect some of the dots here. I appreciated some comments of other th people. Uh, Marsha Cash said something about, um, you know, the, whatever your path and who you encounter is part of your path of how to do that. So whether it's animals, because I've had experiences with shamanics uh, yeah. encounters and, and again, ETs and other people that have had different ways that somehow they've opened up to our inter interconnectedness. So I appreciated everything that you've shared about your own experience it, you know, it has an interesting story to it. And sometimes these stories are a way of teaching people. And I know John knows about his own stories and how he shared some of those right. and very helpful. So I really appreciate hearing about your story today and, and hope to hear more about your own journey with all this. Um, anyway, Thanks, thank you for sharing all that. I appreciate it. And all the other ones that commented too, even uh, Tucker Clark, who just commented something. I appreciate everything that everybody's shared in the chats as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Alice. Let's see what Dave would like to share. Hi, hi, Beth. Hello, and hi, Dave. Greetings from a native Minnesotan. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> we lived in many farms around southeast Minnesota, not over in western Minnesota, but around Mankato, but uh, very familiar with the Minnesota way of life. And, mm -hmm. and thank you so much for the things you have talked about. And uh, my background professionally is in astronomy. Mm. And of course, many astronomers don't want to admit that there's extraterrestrials or they might be contacting us or, mm -hmm. but I have no difficulty with that. A couple of things, let me see, I just wrote it down. I'm reading a, a book by the former, or no, he's actually current sur Surgeon General Mm. of Vivek Murthy, and it's a book about uh, connections, social connections, and uh, especially for loneliness, which is very prevalent mm -hmm. in our society. Mm -hmm. And one of the points he made that I was thinking about that I don't remember the exact comment you made, but it was regarding uh, when you help someone Mm -hmm. You build a relationship and the mm -hmm. fear goes away. Mm -hmm. 
So he talks about, you know, reaching out to strangers. Uh, and he talks about one of his practices he started doing. He'd be in a coffee shop, you know, reading, working on his computer. And he'd, you know, start a conversation with someone. And then rather than when he had to go to the bathroom, rather than packing everything up, he'd say, he'd ask this complete stranger, you know, could you watch my stuff mm-hmm. while I'm gone? And he said he never had anyone let him down. I mean, mm-hmm. everyone, when he came back, yep. stuff was there. And the people said, one of the people said, I thank you for trusting me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think one way we can connect with other people even is to ask for their help. Mm-hmm. Ask and, for to their- s- and to see that people, I found that too, that people are good. Like the average, oh. you and I, we are good people. We aren't, the, I've lost my wallet at least three different times, having forgotten it in the front seat of my cart. Every single time, either the person has called me privately and said, I have it. Where can I drop it off? Are you in Mankato? Mm-hmm. Yes, I am at this pharmacy or it's been at the service desk. All the money is always there. Right. And I just, it has built my trust in humanity. And we have to shift our view from that of negative. Everyone's going to yeah. take my stuff to, yeah. I, and no one's doing that. That's not yeah. true. <laughs> it may I, happen, but it's not as prevalent as we think. And people I, are basically good. Yeah. yeah. I tell that to my friends all the time. Mm-hmm. I've lived overseas, traveled a great deal. And I keep telling people, you know, everyone's the same. So good. Same. Yes. Yeah. The that majority people, of us are good. Yeah, that people mm-hmm. are good. Mm-hmm. They don't have to fear them, but mm-hmm. people don't believe it. No. And I, I think it's funny, too, because when I first went on Facebook in 2011, you know, and I started expanding uh, when I became an author, I'd expand my group uh, to worldwide and inviting people from all over the place. And I realized we all like to share what we had for dinner or made. <laughs> we right. all like to share our children and our lives. We all like to share when we go someplace new. We all like to share our little inner triumphs like, oh my, or we'll share, I'm not feeling so great today. Right. Everybody shares the same stuff no matter where you live on the planet. <laughs> it's well, like food, food and family and travel and, and general life experiences. There's, you know. As yeah. I tell people, just one final thought. Uh, as I tell people, because I've experienced it, you know, I've lived in other cultures where I was mm-hmm. the only, you know, Caucasian. Mm-hmm. And so I've experienced these things in my heart, not from reading books even. Mm-hmm. And here comes the train. Excuse the noise. But uh, so I tell people, you know, I, I see everyone is the same. I mean, mm-hmm. our society tends to emphasize differences but we're not so different. Mm-hmm. We, we have different cultures, we have different skin colors, different languages, but and what makes us essential? Human beings, we you know we all laugh, we all cry, mm-hmm. we all want a better life for our children. Mm-hmm. We're not different, we're all one. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate your message. Thank Very you. Good. You know, people actually like to be asked for directions. Yes. <laughs> you yes. know how to get to so and so. Oh, yes, I yes. can help you. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there is the universal communication link that came up too, because I asked Martha at one point, I said, How can I even understand what you're saying? If you speak a language of song, of musical notes that sound similar to when our whales speak, or that's the most comparable thing, but on a more beautiful orchestral way right. how can i understand your words in my head how is that even being translated because obviously i i don't know how or do you speak english maybe that's it and she said no have you not had success communicating with animals i said i have i've had animals respond to mental um things that i've said to them and they've responded i have responded had plants respond to me i've had deep connections with nature and I go, you're right. How, how can I communicate with a plant or an animal or you? How does any of that work? And she said, the universal translator is the Holy Spirit. Everything alive shares God. And every loving thought you have passes through the mind of God who translates the meaning 
for you. So wow. you can communicate with anything, any being telepathically, any human, you can send them love. They don't even have to know you're sending it. And you'll find they're kinder to you the next day for some reason. They feel better towards you. They probably don't even know why. But there's an that universal translator the Course talks about, the Holy Spirit. Utilize that. And it, it will always go through when it's sincere, positive communication in a loving way. Yes. So we're all joined by that, no matter where we are on the planet or solar system or galaxy or universe. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Let's go to Natalie. This will be our last question, and then uh, we'll come back and. Well, it. it's it's not a question. It's just a commentary. I just okay. want to say thank you. You brought me back to my youth. Even your background of your house there with your knotty pine and logs, very similar to the the place where uh, and the sharing of your uh, Our Lady of Medjugorje experience. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just needing to say that, you know, I am very Portuguese. And so I grew up with the Our Lady of Fatima and yes. the children and, yes. the and the consciousness that you really just had to talk to, to Jesus was too busy to listen. So you really just, yes. to, you really just learned, yeah. to learn how to talk to his mother. Yep. Mary's way well. less busy. She's way less busy. And she's a mom. <laughs> She'll always listen to us kids. Yeah. I had that same always feeling. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, hilarious. My, father, my father was born in a part of Portugal um, that was very close to Fatima uh, just a few years and that apparition is said to have taken place in 1913 so mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean Our Lady of Fatima is a bigger thing than than one can imagine in mm-hmm. Roman Catholic Portuguese Catholicism mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. yes beautiful yes I still Thank hold you, Mother Mary in a special place that um, yeah, absolutely. I finally got her into my backyard. I confiscated an old claw foot tub from an apartment house of mine, painted it red and got a three foot statue of Mary with the three children. Mm. Oh. Wildflowers around her and she's under a tree. Wonderful. Beautiful. Thank Beautiful. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. This was just so delightful to be here today. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too. <laughs> Let me make one kind of a little wrap up uh, thing and then go back to Beth. And then we'll, we always close with uh, reading of the Lord's Prayer from the Course of Miracles. Uh, somebody I noticed uh, in the notes, uh, although I wasn't really looking, but it came up on the screen, was talking about Aaron Abke, who was on with us. I guess it was just the last time back in uh, June. And he's also on, kind of on the cutting front of all this. He's ex- into something called the uh, Law of One which also talks about levels and degrees. I don't know whether you've over seen that or anything or not, but it doesn't matter. I've heard of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, we are, it's, it's a very exciting. We are standing on this place where we can open our hearts more than ever before, I think, mm-hmm. and have this incredible experience. A lot of work goes into this. A lot of work will continue to go into this, but, I'm very optimistic about even the dark spots I know are there, mm-hmm. but that's a part of it. And that can be overcome too. What's, what's the whole course about? It's about overcoming the insanity of the ego, accepting the atonement for ourselves and finally coming home. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Any parting words you'd like to share, uh, Beth, before we. Close? I just want to thank all of you the aspects of my one mind who joined me here today in love and light and it's just been a pleasure to be able to share with you and um, meet you face to face via zoom and to have this space available which is a huge white flag or good flag that things are changing that we have these opportunities to grow in light and love because If there's Zooms out there on negativity, I don't know where they are or what they are. I'm not a part of them, (laughs) but I'm glad there's positive Zooms where people can gather without the cost of travel, without having to, um, I, I didn't. I'm sitting here in my shorts, you know, it's, it's, we're all comfortable and it works and it's easy. And I'm just grateful because we're two or more are gathered. I think we're 50 or more are gathered, how much light and love we just blasted out into the our existence and to reflect back to us the goodness that we we have shared here today and that will be 
transformative, very transformative power. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have you back on again uh, a few months down the road after the book, after the book comes out and it's Sounds had good. more exposure. So that'd be fun. Yeah. Is there anybody who would like to, uh, let me go to my gallery view here, to volunteer to uh, read the Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer from A Course in Miracles. There is. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation for the temptation of the son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. 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 But you might want to explain to somebody what a hobby farm is. Okay. Okay. Yes. Our would, technically in Minnesota, it's 40 acres or less, and we're right at 40 acres. And we knew if we went even an acre more or point one acres more, it put us into a full fledged farm, which is a whole other tax bracket. Right. And means a lot more taxes because they think you're making money on your land. Right. No, right. my my horses don't make me any money and the grass they eat that we grow does not either. So right. <laughs> but yeah, I'll explain that. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, yeah. My wife, we went to dinner last night. I was telling her a little bit about today. Mm -hmm. Um and she said, what's a hobby farm? So it's something you just, uh, you, you don't make any money on the hobby farm. No, it's just a hobby. <laughs> it's just a hobby. You're just having fun. And if you happen to sell a few eggs from your chickens or something like that, you know, all, all is well, but you don't have right. enough acres to make it a sustainable uh -oh. income. See now a hobby farm in Napa, which is all vineyards mm -hmm. is actually, um, very profitable. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sure. Right. You get the That's wine a going. Situation. You're making full use of the land there. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> She's got right. room for her horses and dogs and cats. And, and honeybees. We have honeybees here, yeah, too. Oh, so. good. Mm -hmm. oh, yay. More pollinators. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, we did. We wanted to own the bees themselves and keep them on our property year round. But we looked into it and talked to someone who did that or his dad did that. It is a lot of work. And um, we wanted the honey and the pollinators. And we found this unique solution. There is this company called Honnell's Bees. They will bring bee boxes to your property every spring and take them away every September, October when the flowers oh. are gone. And then around Christmas time, we get a nice box of uh, about four liters of honey, so a gallon of honey, six bottles of their honey barbecue sauce, two containers of honey butter, and that lasts us the whole year, and um, they got a place to put their bee boxes for free. So they give us a year's, basically a year's worth of honey, and they get a summer a summer at our house, and they do that at little farms and properties all around Minnesota, and then in the winter, they go down to Texas. They move all the bees down to Texas. So it's kind of a neat little thing. Interesting. And boy, oh boy, uh, our fruit trees, are, I have like two apple trees, two pear trees, two plum trees, like eight fruit trees along our driveway, and they would barely make any fruit. Once we got those little honeybees, it, they just are, the branches are hanging with fruit. And wow. all our neighbors have said, oh, our stuff is doing so much better in our gardens and our flowers. And I go, yeah, it's our bees. <laughs> Because they, they go yeah. up to three three miles away, those little guys travel. So wow. um, everyone with no, they go longer radius. than that. They go Minnesota to Texas. I mean, right on. <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a semi truck. <laughs> you have to be really tired and with lots of little breaks along the way. I know, you know. right? I know. Yeah. It's funny. But yeah, it's and, and uh, you know, you just don't go near the boxes and you're fine and they leave you alone pretty good. But there are a lot of them. But uh, we're used to them now flying around and we know that. Uh, I can't imagine. They must have a sealed truck that is no. properly air conditioned. How do they move them? No, they, it is literally the boxes stacked. I think we get about two, 100 to 120 boxes. We have like eight wow. pallets 
um, because we have so many flowers for them. And they come out and check the bees every few weeks or so to see how the honey's going. And if it's bursting out of there, they add more bee boxes. So they know now what we can handle because I we have all hay field and even our yard, our grass, even when it's this tall, it's clover, that white clover. So they have ample pollen. And um, so they give us a ton of boxes and they will come out with just a flatbed semi truck, stacks of the hives boxes, and they're just uh, not zip tied, um, tie down on there. And it's just huge. It's a semi trailer, open semi flatbed, the size of a semi truck in boxes and then they go around and make their deliveries in the spring and then they'll keep coming back and adding more as more flowers come into bloom and then uh yeah and and, so and, for, and that's how they ship them is on a flatbed yep just open all the way air down flatbed. to texas so they stay with the hive for the most part because when they leave in the fall for some reason a big pile of them conglomerate on our mailbox anybody left behind besides our mailbox is their new hive it's uh -huh. i think this is our fourth year every fall when they leave the, the left behinds with who get left behind without their queen say well we're gonna get this apartment here that's <laughs> and it's our mailbox and we have to like give it two or three days our mail won't get delivered the mailman's probably like heck no <laughs> touching <laughs> no I'm kidding it's just covered in bees <laughs> it takes about three days to figure out that everybody's gone and we're left behind and i'm kind of sad for them because i don't know what happens to i'm sure they just die because they don't have a queen out I, I don't think they can just make a queen out of nothing well, I, they I don't, don't live long works. anyway no no so i no. and plus winter's just you know on its way around the corner so <laughs> the, a few get left behind but for the most part they stay with the hive and go with their queen and and uh go down to Texas on the flatbed, just open air. They could fly away That's if they awesome. wanted. I know. <laughs> There's a clear implication in the course that there are no levels in heaven. Right. Okay. So spend so a lot of time talking about levels. There is progression. So even in this illusion, we progress. Obviously a murderer has a lot to figure out. And then someone who knows that that's not the answer. So we're always progressing and there are marked leaps where you achieve certain things. Like even here, once you reach a point where you really understand the Course in Miracles and you really are living it, there's a shift inside you to a sense of joy and trust. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's and cool. so these are just sort of... Um, because I said how, because I at one point did ask Martha afterwards, I said, how far does that go on? And, and she said, well, you're always growing closer to God and there will be a point. And it was when she was describing me how time is a sphere. And she said, oh, yes. with That's time cool. being a sphere and everything happening in this ball, that's time. And outside of it is eternity. There's a spiral upward and a spiral downward. And at some point you reach the pinnacle as you're spiraling upward, as you go vertical. Um, that you know they she says she doesn't know how far because no one has come back to say i don't know if you become one with the creator and then start all over again or how that all works but there are it's progressive it's always progressive and so, there are marked points where things are sort of celebrated when you reach right. certain points so progression implies time it, it, it has to it, imply time it I don't understand it myself, right? Because okay. you're not in time anymore when you leave the world of physicality, but there are transitional densities where you are less physical and you can move within and without. And that's where like your, your brain sort of starts to turn into a noodle. Like, well, how big is all this? Because I sort of carb, carb, um, carb, compartmentalized <laughs> everything <laughs> to be earth and not earth, you know? The universe and our planets and not the planets but there are densities within that and and you go with like it's like going inward in rings and you get less and less physical and at some point you lose your physicality but you're still growing you're still learning um still growing closer to the creator which you at some point like how can you even believe you can possibly be any closer but there are so many other levels of experience than our handful of emotions we have in our physical bodies our physical bodies really do limit our experience of feeling and seeing and um, we're limited to basically well illusion and, and our concept is, yes the body itself is part of space time 
Yes, and to move out of space-time, Martha said, it's almost impossible to explain to you what that's like, because I asked what's in those other levels, what does that look like? She said, it'd be like trying to explain to a fish what the, the earth is like. You, <clears throat> you can't even, like, well, there's trees, and you can kind of compare it to your seaweed, but it's not even that close. It is so <laughs> different, and the work you do is not what you think of as work, and it's, it's, she's like, you just, it cannot be explained, but know that you keep always and ever going closer to God. Once you make that final choice, um, which she called my coronation day is when I will get to meet her, <laughs> is when you make the final choice. I never need to be physical again. I've experienced every aspect of that. I need to, to know that that's not the path that I can move out of that now. I've experienced opposite God enough. I, I, I'm good. <laughs> Got the idea. And now I'm ready to keep going on eternally. And, um, and then even in the course, it says you reach back with your hand and help your brother, like he's doing for us with the course, we do that for others. So from time to time, very um, prophetic people will come back like, you know, Buddha and things like that to come back Muhammad or whatever. Um, these great people come back to sort of help us. And in this case, in our lifetime, it was Helen channeling the course. And she herself may not have been, you know, she's just this little diminutive little <laughs> woman <laughs> and, and didn't go abroad teaching like Jesus or anything, but she brought this magnificent message. And so she was one of those spirits who made an agreement. I'm going to come back and, and do my thing. But I, you know, she had to forget like the rest of us and struggle with that. So um, yeah, there, there are levels, but there aren't levels. I, I don't know. I, it's confusing to me too. Mm -hmm.